Before we get to the event, I want to thank our sponsors. Olson Thielen CPAs is a full service accounting firm. Irish Titan is a web development and e-commerce company. Uh, we have a couple of folks in the middle of the room. Uh, Shane, um, and I'm sorry, uh, Justin, sorry Justin. Shane and Justin are here from Irish Titan one more time with the hand wave. So uh, if you need to uh, learn about web development or e-commerce, you can reach out to them. Highland Bank is a local family owned community bank. Um, and we have a couple of folks here, Angie, Ryan, um, we got some over here. I thought I saw somebody else, but anyway, Angie gets all the banking business today. She's over here on my right. Winthrop and Weinstein um, is a general practice law firm and they are a sponsor. And last but not least, right up here in front is Dick Somerset. Wave to everybody, Dick. Uh, the Network Connect is something that Dick and I have been working on for six, seven years. It's a catalytic gateway for connecting investors, companies, and service providers. Um, and uh, Dick would be happy to tell you more about the Network Connect uh, if you would like to learn more about that. A uh, reminder on the RSVPs, if you go to Brown Paper Ticket, uh, it does shut down 24 hours in advance. So yesterday at lunchtime, uh, that shut down. Um, generally, it's the first Thursday in April, I'm going back a week because of uh, my daughter's spring break. So April is the second Thursday, but generally you can put it on a recurring event on your calendar for the first Thursday of the month. The website, as I mentioned before, is clubby.com. You can sign up for the newsletter there as well as become a member and get listed in the business directory. LinkedIn um, has a group club, entrepreneur-minneapolis. There's over 2,700 people in the LinkedIn group. Meetup also uh, has a group for Club E, about 2,000 in there. And then again, the email list you can get on uh, via the Club E uh, website. Lessons from the Garage is also uh, part of the Network Connect. You can see Dick Somerset on that. We have over 200 how-to titles uh, for folks trying to grow their business. Um, it's kind of like Netflix for business owners and entrepreneurs trying to make their companies grow a little faster and be a little more profitable. Again, that's Lessons from the Garage, and you can see Dick Summerstead uh, up here in front afterwards if you want to learn more about that. And then in uh, terms of Club E, um, March 12th, um, actually back to the Network Connect, we have a webinar on intellectual property. Uh, March 19th, Club E and Upsize Magazine has an event on Lessons Learned. Uh, we're going to be talking about on March 19th, exit planning, EOS, and intellectual property. And then Chum Struby here in the middle uh, runs Club in St. Paul, and the March 20th meeting for that is Lead Millennials uh, to Accelerate Business Results. Um, and I guess last but not least, the April 11th event again here in Minneapolis. Uh, we're going to be talking about uh, recruiting, assessing, and retaining um, employee, key employees in today's tight labor market, which uh, talking to companies I'm working with, I know the tight labor market is something we're all dealing with. So that's uh, what we have in upcoming events, which brings us to today's uh, topic and um, our event and why you all are here. So thanks again for coming. Tips for creatively and legally financing uh, your business using the internet. Uh, as I mentioned, we have uh, two speakers. Brian Edstrom is a shareholder at uh, Bison Legal. And Brian is a former regulator at both the federal and state level and uh, an expert in securities offerings. So thank you for joining us, uh, Brian. And then um, just a little twist of fate as we get to talking about stuff, uh, kind of bouncing ideas around fun facts. And so we kind of got off track. We're supposed to be talking about this event and instead it degraded into some fun facts, which by the way, um, in case anybody cares, I'm actually related to the person who names spam. So that right there, I'm, I'm telling you, that doesn't get much better than that. Down in southern Minnesota, Jeff Robbins, my father, and others can attest, that's practically royalty. So just, just so you know, uh, that's my fun fact. As it relates to Brian, he actually played sax on stage with the Violet Femmes. Only once, though, so I don't know the backstory of that, but uh, he was on stage playing the sax with the Violent Femmes once, and spent 42 days on a canoe trip in the Canadian Arctic, ending at the Arctic Ocean. So Not no, at the same time. Not at the same time. Oh. <laughs> All right. Okay. All right. So that's uh, some fun facts uh, about Brian. So thanks for joining us, Brian. And then uh, David Duccini. 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 <laughs> 
there's a joke in there, but uh, since I have four kids and I want to, you know, kind of live to see them prosper, I'm going to not take that conversation any farther, other than you heard how we pronounce his last name. So David is uh, founder and CEO of Silicon Prairie Portal and Exchange. It's a registered securities crowdfunding portal based here in Minnesota. He's also a blockchain and cybersecurity expert. And then the uh, fun fact about the Duchini name is that in Italian, um, it means the little duke. So think of like Il Duce with the Ini on the end. Duchini, which means uh, petite or small. So that's how he got his nickname, the little duke. So you'll actually see that he uses that out in social media. So the little duke is here to join us. And a practically professional saxophone player is also here to join us. And uh, with that, I'll turn it over to these guys. Again, a reminder that uh, we can stay after the one o'clock uh, stop. Uh, they're happy to, to stay and talk. Um, this is supposed to be interactive, so uh, please raise your hands if you, uh, you'd like to learn more. Gentlemen. All right, thank you, Rick, and thank you all for being here. Uh, I know David and I are both excited to have this opportunity to talk with each of you and hopefully answer some questions and create some excitement for opportunities that, that you have moving forward. Um, so as Rick said, uh, I'm Brian Edstrom. I'm an attorney at Abizen Legal PA, which is a boutique business transactional firm here in Minneapolis. Um, we started about 18 months ago or so and uh, we're now up to nine attorneys, and we pride ourselves on having really high-level uh, expertise in a smaller firm environment. So of the nine attorneys, um, we all come from either a big law firm environment, an in-house environment, or in my case, a regulatory environment. Two of my partners are here, Lisa Poulter in back, and Jeff Robbins in front, right up here. So if you have any questions about advising, please, uh, let either of them or me know. And then, as far as my personal background, as, as Rick mentioned, so uh, I've been in private practice for almost two years. Before that, I spent seven years working in federal and state government. So I, after law school, I moved to Washington, D.C. and worked with the DOJ for four years, the Department of Justice. I worked in their Civil Rights Division and then their Civil Division and was working on uh, some big residential mortgage-backed securities civil fraud investigations, which was a uh, very interesting, although tedious process. Um, after that, I moved back to Minnesota and uh, worked for the Minnesota Department of Commerce, where I was the director of securities. And in that role, um, I oversaw staff at the Commerce Department that regulated businesses issuing securities, offering securities, as well as uh, investment advisors and brokers and folks involved in, in recommending and selling securities products. Now in private practice, um, I consider myself somebody who can sort of speak regulator uh, and communicate with regulators and on regulatory issues from the perspective of regulators that tend to look askance at um, innovative developments in, in securities offerings. And I think that can be an asset for people that are trying to be creative in, um, in uh, engaging in things like crowdfunding and uh, blockchain technology and things like that. I'm having trouble with my turn it on side. The yeah, on switch, always a good place to start. OK, so uh, did you try rebooting it? Sorry. Did you try rebooting it? <laughs> yes, I rebooted it. David is the tech expert. I'm the former regulator. That's the way we were. Um, this presentation is intended just to provide information. Um, I'm not providing legal advice. If you'd like to have legal advice on any of these topics, of course, you can talk to me. Um, so the purpose, I, well, before I start, David, please. Oh, sure. Yeah, no thanks. So I'm David Ruccini, founder and CEO of Silicon Prairie Portal Exchange. I'm pretty excited about uh, what we're doing here in the Silicon Prairie. Uh, so much of our talent gets leaked out to the coasts. A lot of the attention, a lot of the money flows. They think of us as kind of a flyover zone. I like to remind people that uh, we invented supercomputing, we invented pacemakers, and the web browser, not even just covert, but the web browser was invented at UIUC. So a lot of the technologies people use and live and depend on were invented right here. So I'm trying to bring some excitement back to our region. So. Uh, my background, uh, software development since the Apple II days. I know it's hard to tell because I look so young. Um, 
I got involved in the blockchain Bitcoin space around 2009 and then uh, immediately recognized the power that this technology had for companies and we'll talk a little bit about that, walk you through a little bit of a journey here. Uh, the very first time I met Brian was when we were going to get our portal app application approved and my reputation sort of preceded me. I'm kind of not known as being shy or reserved, I'm kind of an agent provocateur. So the first time I meet Brian and I sit down and he's just shaking his head, I'm like, hi, how's it going? He's like, we don't know what to do with you. I'm like, what do you mean? I'm just here to get a portal. Well, that's easy. We want to talk about the blockchain stuff. So uh, I said, well, let's, let's do this portal thing and I'll tell you all about the blockchain stuff. And then delighted to have him on my side of the table for once uh, so he can help translate and calm down the people that, you know, commerce, etc. It's all going to be okay. I'm not an, you know, an evil genius. At least that you know of anyway. All right, so let's get into this thing. All right, so before I jump in, I just... To get a kind of feel for who's here, who feels like they're pretty familiar with crowdfunding as a concept already? All right. And how about initial coin offerings or ICOs? All right. Uh, fewer on the, the latter option. So um, the purpose of this presentation is really to talk about how those two options are at least intended to provide alternatives for a business that are looking to raise money. Um, historically, it can, it can sometimes be challenging for new businesses to uh, raise money and they feel like they're stuck bootstrapping the business or trying to approach venture capitalists and angel investors that might feel inaccessible at times. So um, there have recently been developments in securities regulations and in the market to try to create opportunities for people to use the internet in new ways to raise money. Um, these are two of those options. And as I think will become kind of evident over time, there are pros and cons to these options. And um, I have personally some mixed feelings about both of them, but nevertheless, they're worthy of discussion and consideration if you're looking to raise money. So questions we hope to answer are uh, generally just a quick overview on what securities regulations are and what is a securities offering. And um, how do you use crowdfunding and ICOs to lawfully engage in a securities offering to raise money? So the drive parts, I'll try to go through quite, kind of quickly, but um, securities laws, as this slide kind of demonstrates, are old. A lot of the securities laws at the federal level were written in the 30s. Um, state laws are also fairly ancient. Some of them, blue sky laws, have preceded the federal regulations. And obviously, when they were written, they didn't account for things like the internet and blockchain technology and that kind of thing. A lot of regulators, I can speak from experience, are also working in a system where they're used to these old laws, and it can be challenging to try to apply them to new innovations that are occurring now. So that's kind of what um, people like David have been up against and uh, folks that are trying to use crowdfunding and other strategies to raise money. Basically what securities regulations do is uh, they're designed to try to help protect investors from being defrauded or from not having enough information to make an informed decision. Um, so securities regulations require certain disclosures to be made and offering documents. They limit who can sell securities and how they can be sold. Um, and uh, obviously they impose anti-fraud uh, provisions. I'm going to put this up there just to demonstrate how complicated the definition of a security is, and then I'm going to move immediately on so you don't read it. <laughs> Jeff made that suggestion to me uh, earlier today. Um, basically, it makes for a great password, by the way, if you can memorize it. Yeah. Um, defining what a security is, is complicated. And it, that's really up to people like me, uh, lawyers, to figure out. So, um, but a security includes things like stocks and bonds, and also um, something called an investment contract. And a lot of people that start to dive into securities issues and read about it, stumble upon something called the Howey Test, which is an interpretation of what an investment contract is. Quick show of hands on who's heard of the Howey test before. All right. So if you and particularly in the ICO space, um, there are a lot of people that have written things online that um, reach the conclusion that because of the Howey test, in some 
way, shape, or form, an initial coin offering is not a security, it's not an investment contract. I disagree. Um, so does the SEC, so does the SEC. Um, but basically, these four elements describe a, uh, the test for determining uh, whether an investment contract and therefore a security exists. A person invests money in a common enterprise, they're led to expect profits solely from the efforts of others. So if you are considering using the internet to somehow raise money, you need to ask yourself those four questions. Is what you're doing meeting those four elements? Are you, are you creating a situation where potential investors expect profits, they don't plan to participate in running the business, um, they're in a common enterprise with other, inventor, other investors, um, and they're contributing money. If so, it's very likely an investment contract subject to some complex securities regulations, and you should talk to an attorney. Um, and just another thing that I'll touch on briefly, the Howey test is just one of many uh, tests that are employed at the state and federal to determine the state and federal level to determine whether securities regulations apply. So if you have done a little bit of digging into any of that analysis, um, just realize that there might be other cases and are other cases under state law and federal law that, that apply too and it, it's, it's um, uh, dangerous territory to act as an armchair lawyer in. Uh, uh, it's uh, good to get some professional advice. But ultimately, the most important things for you to know about securities regulations and to uh, questions to think about when you're looking to raise money are these five questions here. And the reason is these five questions and the answers thereto dictate um, what securities laws apply and may allow you to conduct a securities offering without going through a complex registration process. How much money do you need? Do you want to raise money from non-accredited investors? I'll define what that means in a minute. How do you want to advertise the offering? Obviously here we're talking about advertising it online, which creates a, a certain host of challenges. How widely do you want to engage in the offering? Does it, do you want to raise money from people just in Minnesota or in all states internationally? And how much can you afford to budget for people like me and accountants to help you do it? Um, different types of offerings are more complex than others and uh, that's a factor to keep in mind. I'm just going to move past this so to not bore you too much, but these are common uh, exemptions under securities laws that apply depending on how you answer those questions. Again, this is something that an attorney can help you sort through. So the first question, how much money do you need? Um, there are some exemptions that allow you to raise an unlimited amount of money but have certain other restrictions. And there are some exemptions that the primary limitation is how much money you can raise. Regulation crowdfunding and MinVest are the two statutes that are most commonly considered the crowdfunding laws, the securities crowdfunding laws. David will be talking about those uh, in a bit more detail. But they limit how much you can raise per year to either $1 million or $2 million, respectively. So, if you're thinking about a crowdfunding offering um, under some of these new crowdfunding programs that you've maybe heard of following the JOBS Act in the past few years, um, you'll need to keep those limits in mind. Some of these other regulations, though, permit you to raise more money, but with other caveats and other restrictions that apply. Another big question is whether or not you want to raise money from non-accredited investors. Uh, the best way to understand who is non-accredited is to understand who is accredited. Um, an accredited investor is somebody who has a high enough net worth or uh, uh, income to meet certain thresholds to be deemed uh, wealthy enough to imply that they have a level of sophistication and a ability to withstand financial loss to not require uh, greater protection under the securities regulations. So a lot of securities regulations restrict sales to non-accredited investors. Um, though MinVest
DHS and regulation crowdfunding, these new rules that open the door to uh, crowdfunding offerings, have more opportunities. They allow for more opportunities to raise money from non-accredited investors. That's kind of a big step that's happened um, in the past few years following the JOBS Act. Um, advertising is another big question that you'll need to ask. In the past, a lot of securities, and, and currently, a lot of securities uh, sales occur privately via private offerings, private placement memorandums, um, in, you know, where a business owner might meet with an investor in a building kind of like this, in a room, you know, over a drink, and uh, decide to uh, ask for an investment in the business. And that's not a public offering that is shared online or via presentation or some other means. Um, obviously, if you post a crowdfunding offering on the internet that is making it available broadly, you're engaged in general advertising and solicitation. Um, again, there are new developments in the laws under regulations, crowdfunding and invest that uh, permit more general advertising and solic solicitation to occur but they don't open the doors completely. You still have to be uh, careful about how you advertise. This is my favorite slide. Um, I, this is a metaphor for how securities laws might apply in an advertising context. So if you can't see that, that is a picture of uh, um, a uh, sea salt container. And on the picture, on the sea salt container, it says, um, formed by the primal sea more than 250 million years ago, but it expires in 2019. So an advertisement violation in the securities context would be to celebrate your product as your, or your business for its, you know, it was formed by the, the sea millions of years ago, but not to disclose that it expires next year. Makes sense? So, um, in securities offerings, really disclosure is the name of the game. If you're advertising a securities offering, it's important uh, that, you also, that you also disclose the applicable risks and uh, uh, potential uh, ways in which somebody could lose money by investing in that offering. Again, a lawyer can help you craft the documents that um, are designed to do that. Um, another, just real quickly, some interesting examples of securities violations. Um, before Google went public with their public offering, um, the founders of Google uh, participated in an interview with Playboy magazine. And um, they talked about the likely successes of Google growing as a business and how it would make money for investors. The SEC didn't like that, the Securities and, Commit uh, the Securities and Exchange Commission. They um, kind of came down on Google for seeding the market uh, by promoting their business in a way um, that, that was uh, not quite compliant with securities regulation. So it's uh, just an interesting, you know, something to think about. You, before you advertise uh, that you're raising money over the internet, you should always be careful to consider um, whether and how uh, uh, advertising restriction might apply. I've also seen uh, quite a few references to crowdfunding offerings online. Um, I heard a story recently about an NPR professor that was crowdfunding uh, to raise money to um, uh, study moose. Uh, I've seen other crowdfunding offerings advertised to uh, raise money for local restaurants and breweries and things like that. There are limits on uh, how you can do that and, and what you can say, so it's important to keep that in mind. But um, in this particular case, this was not a securities offering. Raising money just to study uh, Moose, uh, basically she was asking for contributions or donations, not uh, purchase a security or equity somehow in a business that was engaged in doing that. So um, that would be permitted in that context. Um, where do you want to raise money? Uh, basically, in a nutshell, you just have to keep in mind that if you're raising money using the internet and posting something that can be seen publicly by anybody, 
you need to worry about securities regulations at the federal level and in every state where somebody could see that offering. Um, securities regulations apply to the offer, not just the sale. So um, uh, uh, it's important to keep in mind that there are a whole network of regulations that might apply. And finally, uh, uh, when you talk to an attorney about your different options, they'll be able to explain to you the different requirements that are applicable. Um, but again, it's just you, something to keep in mind is you'll likely need to work with an attorney and, a, and an accountant to put together something that's professional and that uh, both gets the job done to attract investors but also complies with applicable regulations. So I'm not going to get deep into this, but um, if you were to visit with an attorney, they might uh, explain different examples to you kind of like this. And it, these are different regulations that apply uh, kind of compared to those five questions that I posited at the beginning of that portion. So David, do you want to chime in on? Yeah, yes, thank you so much. So that's the stuff that makes it all legal. Now we're going to talk about how it actually works in real life. Can I grab the uh, clicker for me, please? Yes. Okay, so how many people have heard of Kickstarter? Yeah, that's good. Okay, that makes it so much easier. So just a couple of years ago, so we're uh, Silicon Prairie Public Exchange. We're now in our third year of business. So literally three years ago, I would start with that question, and I would sometimes get blank stares, like people had not heard of Kickstarter. Um, and so then I would go on and get go find me, right? Go find me, right? Social begging, right? Okay, that's good. If you had not heard of Kickstarter or GoFundMe, I literally had no basis to tell you what crowdfunding was. So I'm delighted to see that more people have heard of, uh, heard of Kickstarter. So crowdfunding is basically in a nutshell, what we like to say is if you don't have an angel investor to give you a check for $100,000, you can put together a crowd of friends, 100 people, each giving you $1,000 to get you that $100,000. And that is in a nutshell, uh, crowdfunding. So several types of it, we, there are rewards based, the, the Kickstarters of the world, the social begging like the, the GoFundMe's, the laws don't apply because you're not buying a piece of the business. You're buying an early product. You're buying participation. Uh, uh, whether it's, you know, you're, you're feeling good about your investment, or not your investment, you're feeling good about your donation, or you're hoping to get something. So, quick show of hands, how many people invested in Kickstarter and did not get their thing? Mm -hmm. Am I the only one? Wow. Maybe it's just me. I stopped investing in Kickstarter because I got tired of not getting my stuff, so which might be a version of fraud. So if you do promise to deliver something you don't deliver, that might be fraud. So security crowdfunding is, is different in that you are selling the upside of your business. And this is an important part. So we see tons of entrepreneurs who come in who think they want to raise money from the public. And that's great, they should. Um, and assuming they have a business plan, that's also awesome. But they tend to focus on their amazing product and not the amazing upside and potential of their business. And that's a big differentiator between raising money from people and just trying to sell your product. And if you can sell your product, we absolutely tell you that revenue is your best source of capital. But if you don't, you know, if you're not quite there yet, uh, securities crowdfunding might be the right, uh, might, uh, uh, the right option for you. So rewards based, we touched on that, Kickstarter, Indiegogo. Some of the most successful uh, crowdfunding campaign stories, Oculus Rift, these are the VR goggle people. They held a successful Kickstarter campaign. $2.5 million was raised from I think about 9,000 backers. So those 9,000 people right now have an obsolete brick sitting on their shelf, right? They got the first generation of that Oculus Rift instead of the people who came in just after them and got $2 billion when they sold it to Facebook, those people got 20X on their money, right? So those first early backers, instead of having the right to pay off a student loan or put a down payment on a house or buy a car, right? Now have an obsolete, they've got bragging rights for an obsolete brick on their shelf. And we don't think that's very equitable. Locally, Astropad raised a ton of money, a good amount of that money went just to build the product. Um, and then the potato salad guy, we like to use this example. Um, this is the exception, right? This is the person that wanted to raise money on Kickstarter for a potato salad recipe. That was actually posted on Kickstarter and people just, it went viral and they raised about five hundred, you know, $55,000. Uh, there will only ever be one potato salad guy. So we call this sort of the post and pray approach, uh, which doesn't work for most, uh, most uh, campaign. So the reality is, is that crowdfunding is not going to bring the crowd to you. You have to bring your own crowd. Now that stated, we absolutely have a book of investors that have invested on our site as well as other sites that we can make aware of your crowdfunding campaign. But the reality is, is that 
people aren't just don't don't have just like excess money just waiting to give you, right? I mean, most people have things to do with their money, and so the post and pray is not very satisfying. Uh, most of your Kickstarter campaigns uh, raise less than ten thousand uh, dollars. Okay, that's not a very good target if you're trying to raise money for your business because ten thousand dollars will get eaten up between people like Brian and myself just to get you to advance. Um, over sixty-three percent of the Kickstarter projects fail to reach their minimum target. There is nothing sadder than looking at a, at a Kickstarter campaign that where the backer themselves hasn't even put in like five dollars or ten dollars, like that zero dollar Kickstarter, right? It should take a lesson from uh, musicians, right? So if you're like, you know, you're walking as a musician in an open guitar case, right? The ones that actually put money in there first, they call salting it, right? We'll do better. The the inertia to be the first person to give someone money is really high. So and we've seen that also that also holds true in investment crowdfunding. So again, it's just like Kickstarter, but you're selling a piece of the business. There are obviously several exemptions to do that. We can help you find and navigate that space uh, to do that. And then working with with a uh, with security attorney. So. Silicon Prairie Portal Exchange, we are a state-based and national portal. So we launched in Minnesota in 2016. We did actually raise money for ourselves. Uh, we were the very first campaign. We wanted to eat our own dog food, to go through the process, to pay an attorney a lot of money to produce this artisanal, handcrafted, bespoke private placement memorandum at a princely sum of about $15,000. Uh, and then we then started opening up in Wisconsin, Iowa, Michigan, and then Part of our use of funds was to go national, so we can do these national crowdfunding campaigns. And along the way, we built some document automation that get that PPM price down uh, from uh, the exorbitant price of 15K, which should have come artisanally handcrafted in hand tooled leather for that price, uh, but did not. In fact, I think I had to print my own copy of it. I don't, think I... don't be like me. Um, I feel like I'm a poster child for private placement memorandums. Um, so this is a, a quick example. This was a screenshot from just this very morning. Uh, so crowdfunding has been working pretty well for breweries. Cultural Works has had some challenges. Uh, they did not get approval from Roseville to open up their location there, so they're going to reboot their campaign probably this year once they pick a new location. But breweries, they have a natural crowd built in. It's a natural, easy product. You invest some money, you get some free beer, you own a slice of a, you know, potentially a successful brewery. Um, and then we raise some money. We've had other campaigns that are not listed here that were not affected. Uh, but then real estate recently is starting to get really hot because it's really easy for people to understand what they're investing in. So with securities crowdfunding, you can sell equity, you can sell debt, you can sell revenue share, you can sell a convertible note. It's really up to you what you want to sell. So people are worried about potentially poisoning their cap table from having thousands of investors, right? You could just do a debt offering. So you don't have anybody on your cap table, right? It's totally up to you what you want to sell. So the, step, the steps for us are the, the, steps to the same steps with just about any portal. You're going to decide that crowdfunding is right for you. And that is actually an important step. If you've got a team of people, all of you have to agree that you, this is the way you want to go. You can't have just one champion. If the whole company and the whole team is not on board, it's not going to succeed. So you have to decide that it's right for you. You get your documents together, and then you, you know, put your, your, your PPM together. You get your exemption in place. Uh, it gets published. Funds flow, you feel the love. Um, here's what it kind of looks like uh, at the highest level. This is the big picture, and we'll make this available to you if you want to get a copy of this. But here's you, you want to raise some money, uh, you sign an agreement with us, uh, we pair you up with a security attorney, we have some document automation stuff that happens, they get prepared, they get filed, there's a QC check. At this point, you're now made effective, you can start advertising, your investors can start buying, you reach your goal, the money is released from the bank, and ta -da, you know how the money, and then your investors get their shares, right? Pretty straightforward. That looks so good. Thanks, Jade. I mean, there's Jade right there. Jade is uh, amazing at a uh, shout out for Lucid Chart. If you don't know Lucid Chart, you should get Lucid Chart. Right? So it's, the success story is the most recent one. So again, real estate, we've had uh, crowdfunding, uh, 201 crowdfund, uh, buying building in downtown St. Paul, mixed Bruce. Lexington investors, $1.4 million raised for a multifamily uh, building in Lexington, Kentucky, even though it's a Minnesota-based business. These both use the older exemption score, and then we raise money for ourselves uh, on our portal uh, doing an um, invest raise. So it, it, does, it does work. It does require uh, a little bit of work. We have about a 40-page uh, workbook that helps you go through the best practices, but it is as much a marketing effort as it is a financing effort. You're going to be have to, you know, socialize the upside of your business and get out and talk to people and ask and get used to hearing no. 
So just like with uh, rewards-based crowdfunding, you know, about 40% of the securities crowdfunding offerings don't hit their minimum target. So that's not very satisfying if you're spending a lot of money with a lawyer or with a portal, and then you don't go anywhere. So this is one of the things that we're you know, laser focused on is trying to get the friction and cost out of that to make it even worth trying. And so we've got some stuff in the background we can talk about privately that we're trying to get to a point where we can make that even cheaper to, to even try to, to raise. But you do have options, right? You have friends, family, you can go to a bank, uh, maybe get an SBA loan, but you know, 40% uh, don't hit that target. That's, you know, we'd like to see 80% or 90% of the people get funded. Um, and that really just goes to the quality of the offerings. And then it's still early days, we don't know. There haven't really been any high successful exits. Not here in the US. There is, I think it's Brewdog in England has now expanded here. They've taken on tens of thousands of investors. I think they just got bought out by a private equity group. You know? And so it's still really early days yet um, because people, you know, they're making investments in you and then in your product. And then if the crowd is into it, you might get more money for it. But you know, you have to have an exit strategy. I mean, most angel investors are used to being married to their investments for seven, eight years. We're hoping that with the secondary market, we can shorten that cycle. And we'll talk a little bit about that. So, show of hands, how many people have heard of Bitcoin? That's awesome. How many people have heard of the word blockchain? No, oh, that's good. That's okay. Uh, so, Bitcoin is now 10 years old. This is important because almost every new technology takes about 20 years to hit mainstream adoption. Think about microwave ovens, cell phones. Right. More people have heard of Bitcoin and blockchain than they've heard of investment crowdfunding, and that makes sense since it only got launched around 2012 and didn't get going until 2016. So we're really in the early days of crowdfunding. So at the highest level, I'm going to do just a baby walk through of blockchain. We do actually a full um, meetup every month on the first Tuesday at our space, grab a card, and we will blow your mind within seven minutes on, uh, on the blockchain space uh, every month. Otherwise, you can come see us every Friday morning. So, the reason this is important is because I'm going to walk you through, we've talked through the security side, we've talked about the crowdfunding side, I'm going to give you a baby walk to a blockchain to get into the ICO space. So, a blockchain is literally nothing more than an Excel spreadsheet that's shared peer to peer. Right? It's a distributed ledger, it's an Excel spreadsheet, not literally an Excel spreadsheet, but it's like an Excel spreadsheet, shared peer to peer. And so, every so often, you get a full page of transactions that gets signed off and that part of that signature goes into the next page of transactions so that you can't go back in time and change that previous transaction. Now what makes it magical is this consensus happens peer to peer automatically in the background. So just like if you had three of you in your office and you took an Excel spreadsheet home over the weekend and you're working on it, you come back in on Monday morning, what does it take to get consensus? It takes two out of three of you to agree, right? This is true. And that's essentially what's going on with the blockchain in the background. You're getting consensus automatically. So the word blockchain is just synonymous with a distributed ledger. Uh, it's really good for anything where you need an audit trail. It's not great for everything. It's been described as the world's slowest database. Uh, but it is the underlying technology of Bitcoin. And why this is important is that we think that this technology could be used by every company to keep track of their shareholders. So every company could have its own version of Bitcoin to keep track of its shareholders so that you could do voting and then ultimately liquidity. That's what we're after. So at the highest level, blocks of transactions are chained to another block of transactions such that you can't go back in time and change it. It's tamper proof, uh, which is really interesting. Uh, entries are probational until they get confirmed so that it deals with, you know, can take care of issues of fraud. Uh, the bigger the network, the stronger the network. So cryptocurrency, Bitcoin, is really just the first proof of work, or proof example, I should say, um, that demonstrates what a blockchain can do. Uh, we won't bore you too much with the mining process, but instead of coupons or gift cards, people that participated in Bitcoin early on got more Bitcoin for that. Uh, and that, as we can see, that uh, the worth of a thing is the price of a brain. Why does it have value? Because people perceive it has value, right? It's not a fair comparison to talk about gold. Gold has utility value. The fiat paper money we have is backed by things like guns and drugs and debt. So um, for a whole philosophical teardown on the history of money comes soon sometimes. So. so some of the examples you've heard of Bitcoin, Ethereum, and Litecoin, da 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 da. There's zillions and zillions of clones out there. Most of them don't do anything of any useful value. They are brand-only coins. We're now entering a phase of sort of the second wave of digital currencies that are actually starting to do things. Uh, why this is interesting is that things like Ethereum make creating brand new tokens, which are like their own cryptocurrency, uh, stupid simple. You can go online in about 15 minutes create a token. 
um, doesn't necessarily mean it, 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 it has any kind of value. So the ICO was meant to sound like initial public offering. Thank you. I'm so used to saying like crowd offering, it sounds like I'm a friend of it. So thank you, right? The initial public offering. So an ICO was essentially meant to be, hey, I'm going to raise money. I'm going to give you these shares. And I get rich, and you get my, my tokens. And then see ya, right? Which is basically what uh, most people have been doing. So they've been trying to use things like you know, the Howey test and try to go online and try to tell you that it's not a security. But absolutely, if it walks like a duck and talks like a duck, the SEC is going to regulate it like a duck. So. Uh, but it's basically based on, black, on blockchain technology. There have been some success stories. Uh, Filecoin, when Digital Telegram Group raised just a ton of money in the space. Uh, Kodak Coin, I think, is that actually even the day? Was that, I can't remember if that's actually a real thing or not. I thought that at the end of the day, it just ended up being like a way for them to try and pump their stock. I don't know. Yeah, I, don't, I guess I don't know the outcome of that. But the interesting thing about these three examples is um, Although they're kind of dubbed an ICO, an initial coin offering, I think all three of these were conducted within the structure of securities regulations. A lot of ICOs are not, and if you do, correct me for that. Yeah, sure, yeah. But even, even before I get to that, so say you could create a cryptocurrency or token of some, of some kind that could generate enough interest to allow you to raise $1.7 billion. Um, what would the company possibly do with that and be able to uh, provide some incentive to the, all those investors at the end of the day that would make raising that much money a, a practical solution? So sometimes um, just the hype of an initial coin offering isn't necessarily um, a good thing. So it, it, it's kind of yet to be seen whether these are actually success stories. But um, more often than not, uh, regulators have really begun to crack down on cryptocurrency exchanges and initial coin offerings in the last couple of years. So if you came to this presentation thinking, I really hope to do an initial coin offering, I'm sorry to tell you that's probably not the best strategy. But there are strategies where you can use um, uh, smart contracts, uh, blockchain technology, and some of the underlying themes that have created cryptocurrencies and securities or, and tokens uh, to conduct securities offerings. So that's a, a very um, cutting edge kind of new direction that uh, certain um, securities offerings are going in. And uh, regulators from the SEC to um, uh, FINRA, a regulator broker dealers to state regulators have all issued very public statements uh, really cracking down on initial point offerings and, and cryptocurrencies. So there's, um, there's a, a lot of reason to be a little concerned about that space. And a couple areas of why initial coin offerings have gone wrong and why they've garnered some negative attention from regulators. For a while, there are these celebrity promoters of initial coin offerings. Paris Hilton and uh, Floyd Mayweather um, both made you know, statements to their millions of followers on Instagram and Twitter and things like that. Other celebrities have done similar things and have gotten in trouble and gotten the businesses that no, left, no doubt paid them a lot of money to do that in trouble. And there's been, I was mentioning earlier that there's been some, a fair amount of things published on the internet from people in the ICO space trying to say that ICOs are utility tokens and they're not securities and they, they tend to have some kind of white paper explaining why the Howey test doesn't apply and I'd be uh, real cautious of, of believing that securities regulations don't apply if somebody other than an attorney has reached that conclusion. Um, it, it's just, it, it's going to be quite rare that uh, uh, something, uh, um, a blockchain based token that's used to raise money um, by, by having the token represent some financial interest in a business, it's going to be unusual that that is not somehow subject to securities regulations. One of those stupidest ones I saw was someone who was trying to raise money for a smart suitcase. So if you bought the token, that would somehow allow you to use their smart suitcase. 
Does that make any sense? Uh, put a nickel in your gas tank to use your smart suitcase, it didn't make any sense at all. So occasionally we, we've had people um, come in and ask us how do we engage in an ICO legally. And really the most important thing to think about there is, David was just kind of thinking at is what does the token really represent? Um, often if it represents uh, just equity in the company, you can just call that a um, stock in the company or a membership interest in an LLC. It doesn't need to be called a token. Um, do it, just calling it a token or a utility token does not make it uh, something that is other than a security. And usually it's just kind of a, um, a flashy marketing tool that uh, doesn't really get the business owner anywhere other than potentially um, calling attention, unwanted attention from regulators. Like the Long Island Blockchain Tea Company, for instance. So Long Island Tea Company recently changed their name, uh, that was about six months ago, they changed their name formally to the Long Island Blockchain Tea Company and their stock shot up like 1600% and the SEC shut them down. They didn't do anything blockchain other than just putting blockchain. It's a little bit like the dot com days. I'll take the thing back here. So the good news is, is that we think um, we found a path to do this legally compliant. We now call an ICO an initial crowd offering. So you, using these exemptions, you can pair up a securities raise, a legitimate legal investment to do some crowdfunding, pair it up with a stock transfer agent, and then some blockchain work to create that sweet intersection between here is my security and here is my blockchain. And I have an example here. This is the future, we think, of what a stock certificate will look like. It has a QR code on the front. That's the public key and a private key on the back of it. So if someone could have a paper stock certificate take their phone, scan it, and see if it still had value or not. Your phone would go look it up on the blockchain to see if it had value. So we think we have an intersection between the legacy paper stock certificate world and uh, the new world of blockchains using this crusty old thing called the stock transfer agent. So is crowdfunding or an ICO right for you? Do you have a well thought through business plan, right? Fundamentally people are investing in your business, the upside of your business. Do you have a marketable story? Again, you're going to have to bring your own crowd in the early days, right? Your friends, your family, your friends of friends. Um, do you have a compelling idea for using blockchain technology? There's lots of really good use cases for this technology. Anytime you need an audit trail, right? Everything you can see blockchains being used as flight recorders in your car, for instance, right? There's tons of, tons of applications for this technology. And then are you comfortable with securities laws, compliance, or can you make a friend with a securities attorney? Jeff here is very personal. You can make a friend with Jeff or with Brian. Um, if you're not comfortable, you can outsource your comfort level uh, to, uh, to the securities attorney. So where do we go from here? This is kind of our last slide. Um, so when we launched our company three years ago, it was Silicon Prairie Portal and Exchange. We've got the portal piece in place now. We are now laser focused on bringing about a secondary market because if you buy in your friend's brewery, you absolutely have the right to sell your ownership in your friend's brewery. And so I'm happy to announce that we have a sponsor in the Senate, Senator Eric Pratt, um, working with the revisor's office right now uh, on what we call min trade to bring about a secondary market for these exempt securities because liquidity is everything. You have the right to transact. So with that, uh, we'll open up to any questions. Thoughts? Yes, right here. How are, the, how are the hackers able to get through the blockchain technology? I mean, North Korea or whoever it is, it doesn't matter. How are they able to hack into that? Are they breaking into the server section in one part of the world and then the other is affected? Yeah, so the question is how are hackers breaking in, into the, the blockchain technology? What they're actually doing is they're breaking into your computer to steal your coins individually. But the blockchain itself is just this log file, it's just this transaction log. And so they're going after you individually. They're trying to get you through phishing emails, clickbait to download software on your machine so they can steal your coins individually. But by and large, the blockchain itself is just a log file. And so anything can be put into a blockchain, it doesn't make it true. But what the hackers are after is they're actually after your coins. Because once it's gone, it's gone, maybe gone. There's no bank you can cry to. And that's both the strength and weakness of the, of the technology. Good question. Yeah, back there. Well, so a bit of a follow-up. If the blockchain says they're my coins, but you steal them, doesn't the blockchain still say they're mine? No, the question is if the blockchain says they belong to one person and somebody steals them, isn't the ownership 
uh, still maintained? The short answer is no. If you have a private key and you lose that private key, someone can move those coins from that private key to another private key and you can't get it back. Right, so things that we're thinking about, right, so this, this is still just the Wild West days. These are just the early versions of these cryptocurrencies. We think that in the future, if you use a blockchain, and just let, let me just take one step back here, there is no one blockchain to rule them all. Everybody can have their own blockchain. Right? For as many Excel spreadsheets are, there could be that many blockchains. But we think that, to that point, we're being very sort of intentional on our side to say, let's create uh, an escrow-like service, right? so that the stock transfer agent Ultimately, at the end of the day, if we're talking about securities in a company, your stock transfer agent is the authoritative system of record for who owns what. So even if a hacker steals your private key, the stock transfer agent can still act as a guardian there to prevent that you know, further transfer. We could put a poison pill into the network so that would lock those shares down so they could not be moved on the network. Right? Bitcoin doesn't exist that way because it's meant to deal with adversarial trust, but you could absolutely create a blockchain that allowed for things just like that. Good question. Who's, uh, who's raising money? Yeah. Always be raising money. There's never an end for the need to raise capital. Come on, don't be shy. Good. What's the financial sweet spot to go down this road? What? what? Sure. Big, what's kind of the best? Yeah, that's a great question. So the question is, what's the financial sweet spot? So today we say fifty thousand dollars is sort of the floor. And that's mainly because of the cost of legal. It costs the same if you're raising $50,000 or $5 million on the legal side, plus or minus. So uh, on the portal side, uh, we have to charge fixed fees in Minnesota. We can charge a percentage in other geographies. We've got to ask right now to see if we can do some tinkering so that we can either become a broker dealer so that we can charge a percentage. We're laser focused on lowering that cost of capital. We'd like to see it get down to the $10,000 you know, price point. If you had a very simple note, a simple promissory note where it didn't require a, you know, heavy lifting on the lawyer's side to at least even try raising $10,000, we're hoping to demonstrate that later this year. But today, $50,000, just again, your cost of capital, and that's where laser are focused on. What does it cost you to get that capital beyond the human cost of getting a car and begging from angels or driving out to the valley or whatever? Uh, $50,000 is kind of for up to $5 million under these exemptions, and then paired with other exemptions, you could raise unlimited amounts of money. Yeah, back there. So what's the typical all-in cost? Lawyers, you, other? Yeah, the all-in cost. So we try to we try to target it around $10,000 all-in for year one. Uh, it depends if, which exemption. You may have to you know, have an outside accountant review or audit your financials. We know people that will do that as low as $2,500 on a simple review. Uh, otherwise, you can spend you know limited amounts on lawyers and accountants. But on the portal side, our, our, our amounts are, are fixed fees or a percentage of the raise. But you're, we, we, try to, we try to, if you're ready to go and you have your business plan figured out and you have your financials done, uh, we think that you could probably get in you know, between ten and between ten and fifteen thousand dollars, which is why we think that fifty thousand dollar mark is really the minimum viable you know, for, for your business. I'll just weigh in on that too. It's always difficult to estimate legal costs because it can vary so much depending on the complexity of a business and how far along they are in putting things together. But in terms of just a sweet spot of when you decide to do a crowdfunding offering, um, it makes it easier for everybody, for the business, for the attorney, the accountant, for David's portal, if uh, you really have your ducks in a row pretty well already. So you have a, a promising business plan, something that's well thought out, you have um, well-documented corporate records and things like that. Uh, that will help you reduce legal costs or keep them from being very high. But again, uh, part of what our job is as lawyers is to help you navigate those challenges in a way that um, keeps you out of trouble, but also allows you to successfully uh, reach the investors that you're trying to target. Now, these guys are really going to help you with your operating agreement. That's kind of a boring document. Most people don't even think about um, But your operating agreement is essentially your Bible for your business, and that agreement must spell out what your shareholders, uh, what their rights are, right? And so a lot of times, companies may want to have a right of first refusal to buy their shares back. And we think this is going to become more important once we get an exchange online. Companies might want to have that right of first refusal to buy their shares back versus having them on the open market, right? Well, that goes into your operating agreement. That's what these guys are going to help you figure out on the front side. Um, if you are worried about having a ton of investors, you're going to hear this advice from tons of angels, like, you know, you're going to blow up your cap table. Don't worry about it. If they're not going to write you a check today, 
Tell them to take a deep breath and just relax. You can either do a raise in a separate company, right, a special purpose vehicle, depending on the exemption, or you just, you just sell something that's not equity. You could sell debt, convertible, safe. Uh, it's, it's totally up to you. I mean, what right now, you just need to focus on your today problem to get across that valley of death. And if that angel investor is not going to write you a check, thank them for their free advice and come see me. What else? Go ahead. Yeah, that's a great question. So we are uh, registered with the state as a state-based portal operator. We're registered in Minnesota, Wisconsin, Iowa, and Michigan, reporting to their various departments of commerce. And then we are absolutely regulated by FINRA on our federal funding portal side. So we are a FINRA member for our federal funding portal. Good question. Also, I'm too old and too pretty to go to jail. <laughs> All right, so again, we have the room as long as anybody wants to stay. They're contacted. Thanks so much, Rick. Thank you. Thank you.